Okay, great. So our next panel is uh, how to build a positive team culture. So I'll have all the panelists come up on stage. Yes, there we go. Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So to start off our panel, I'll have each of the panelists introduce themselves, what startup uh, or what company they work for, the size of their organization, and a 30-second uh, intro on what their startup does. Starting with me. Starting with you. All right. My name is Robin Hunnicky. I am the CEO of Phenomena, do, 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 do. <laughs> which is a, 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 it's a video game company, I guess you would say. We make video games uh, for lots of emerging platforms. So we specialize in new games and new experiences for new technologies. So we work on the Magic Leap, and we've worked on the HoloLens and all these other things. So we, we work on a lot of uh, XR projects. There are about 30 of us now. Uh, we've been in business for about six years, and my background is in game design. Um, I started the company with the idea of building a de deliberately developmental organization that is diverse. So we are 65, 70% non-cis white male, uh, which is very unusual for a video game company. And uh, I think what we excel at is bringing unique perspectives to unique hardware, which makes us successful in that space. Hi, I'm Cheryl Baer from Living Pop-Ups, and we create um, immersive experiences using AR with purpose in education and travel primarily and live events, and making it meaningful and something that you want to continue with. So, uh, And we have a group of 12 people, and it's uh, there's no I in team. So for us, it's really the collaborative effort of the unique team that we have. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Jesse Irwin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for IME Law. Um, IME exists to help our clients understand and manage the risk of bringing bold ideas to life um, in traditional, interactive, and immersive media. So augmented, mixed, and virtual reality. Um, we're a boutique firm, but we work on um, large-scale transactions internationally and in the US. Um, so we have a bit of an interesting model in that uh, we operate a, a bit like a tech company in that way that uh, sometimes we have to scale up to you know, 14 or 15 lawyers that we're managing on transactions across several markets. So very interesting uh, challenges as it relates to culture and opportunities. Hi, I'm Melissa Painter. I run Map Lab, which is an immersive product design studio. We work predominantly in augmented, well, across the whole platform, so augmented, um, virtual, and mixed, but really thinking about expression of immersive digital as multi-platform experiences and helping companies like Lululemon think about shepherding their expertise um, and issue areas into emergent technology as new services. And our core team is five people, but we scale up and down to teams from three to 60 on projects. So I, my background is out of um, traditional filmmaking and we're very much following that formula trying to look for having that agility against bringing right team to right project, because we're usually working on really cutting edge tech and, and it gives us more adaptiveness. Perfect, so since we're at AWE, why did you guys decide to get into XR? And what was the sort of the tipping point of no return for you in this XR journey? <laughs> For me, I went from traditional storytelling, um, really loving film for its ability to put each other in others' vantage points, wanting to see the world through other people's eyes. There was a moment at which it felt like traditional filmmaking wasn't giving those kinds of stories much opportunity, and I moved towards documentary, which is really the challenge of constructing meaning out of the real world, making story out of the real world. The first time I touched immersive as a medium, I realized that it was a method of make where that sort of... Um, chance and input of the user could be a persistent part of the story. And from that moment, I was just hooked. Anyone else want to answer? Yeah, Jesse? Uh, the tipping point for me was experiencing giant VR. I don't know how many people um, tried that experience a couple of years ago. It was created by Melissa Zak and Winslow Porter of New Reality Co. Um, but at that time, I had just left um, a position in philanthropy and fundraising, um, working on uh, really pressing social causes, and was pretty disheartened at what it took to get people to invest in a social mission um, at that point. And uh, as soon as I tried that experience, you know, it was used to, to raise awareness um, around what it's like to live in a war zone and the refugee crisis. It was, this is it. This is a lot of what you're saying. This is going to be the medium that is going to um, advance us forward. 
Um, so that led to the founding of our immersive media practice. Since then, we've diversified in a lot of different ways um, in terms of working with you know uh, companies with applications for enterprise and entertainment, but um, kept our core uh, focus on using immersive tech for good and you know dedicating hundreds of hours pro bono to um, to to see uh, that come to life. I actually um, started uh, because I was in AI and games, so I actually have a background in AI and robotics, and I left that background to make video games because I wanted to not build drones, basically. <laughs> I didn't want to kill people with the tech that I was working on. Um, or deliver packages. Yeah, just, yeah, deliver packages, search and rescue, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> just, just one instruction. Um, so, but while I was in grad school, I spent a lot of time with a bunch of weird game developers that wanted to do stuff at the edges of that space, and I helped uh, start this group that invented a thing called Game Jams, and so we built games, and then we gave them away for free on the internet, and uh, Atman Binstock, who is one of the people that I collaborated with on the early Game Jams, ended up becoming someone who was working at Valve on 4K immersive VR headsets. And so I actually went to Valve about, oh God, it was like six or seven years ago now, and saw the very first room prototype. And I just walked away from that conversation with him. Like, it was supposed to just be lunch and checking out the thing. And I ended up staying there almost through dinner. We just sat and talked for a super long time. Like, wow, is it really gonna happen? Like, is it really, is it now? Is it now? Is it really now? Um, and at the time, it didn't seem like it was really going to be now. There were a lot of barriers, and maybe Gabe wouldn't want to make the technology public, and la, 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 it was super secret. Um, so I fell into it because it was so amazing. And that was when it was super jank, like just taped together headsets kind of stuff. Like it was not, it was not even close to what it is now. And so what's so exciting to me is that I went from being super thirsty about like working on this platform that I thought would never exist in five years, I have a whole business based on serving, you know, the Oculus Rift and the Vive and emerging hardware and AR and VR and also, you know, maybe room scale experiences and rides and all this stuff. So for me, it's like, holy shit, basically. Like, you know, the holy shit chant? Holy shit, holy <laughs> shit. Like, that's, that's what it feels like for me because I, I, I went from it being a friend's kind of pet project that would never get funded to a whole conference and industry and all this shit. So, I mean, it's yeah. kind of amazing. For me, I came from uh, television and film. So having been at ABC and developed human experiences with human characters, like my so-called life or Freaks and Geeks and that 70s show and Family Guy and- All of our favorites. <laughs> that was okay. awesome. Um, and realizing that developing characters that are like people, um, because they are based on people, it's the human beings that you connect to and it's the stories that they share. And so um, when I did that 70s show, it was the first time we used 360 camera work um, on a sitcom. And Malcolm in the Middle was the first single camera. So to me, using new technology was very exciting in how to create the characters and the stories that can live with you in your world on a daily basis and make it feel like they're your community. Mm -hmm. So there's a social action piece. I love that. So diving in, because our panel is not just about XR, it's also about culture, right? So uh, I always think of culture as like the truth telling of an organization. Like you can have whatever policy and org structure you want, but culture is the totality of the behaviors of the organization, both internally, how the employees work, as well as externally, how you work with your customers and your vendors and your supply chains and all of it, right? It's like the, it's the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful, right? And, and it, it's, uh, uh, it makes the magic or it makes the dog-eat-dog -dog world, right? So it depends on which way you look at it. Uh, and so let's just kind of start off because we talked about positive culture with this title. Do we believe that employees deserve to be happy at work? Is that like a fundamental understanding that we all agree to? Um, and so anyone, just jump in. What do we think? Absolutely. Employees <laughs> deserve to be happy. Thank God. At right? work. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, I, you know, both from a human values perspective, but also from a business perspective, right? I mean, there's, there's ample research out there uh, of the correlation between, uh, you know, satisfaction in the workplace and uh, performance and financial performance of an organization. And um, Glassdoor actually has been doing a lot in this space and, um, you know, recently found that the companies that were um, on their, you know, best company to work for list every year um, outperform the S&P 500. 
Um, and I think that was 2009 to 2014. So they, awesome you know, they study. studied this for five years, and um, I think another one just came out. But, but absolutely, happy employees are more productive employees. Awesome. They're more inspired. They want to give, they feel like they're a part of something and their ideas matter. And so, and they're human. So even if they had a bad moment beforehand, like any other human being, mm -hmm. it's what can we do and how can we help to reset the moment so that there's positive flow. And once you have positive flow, then you have more people eager to be there, eager to work extra hours, and eager to add their ideas. Melissa, did you want to add something to you? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about this moment in this medium that's drawing many kinds of people. I mean, there's school diggers, and there's this is our territory over here, and plant the flag and don't do the work. But there's also people who are here who believe it's a moment where we're going to change everything. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I've loved about teaming up in this space is finding people who come from disciplines that are such different languages, I have no deep understanding and never will exactly what they're up against. And yet we have profoundly shared values to the point that I would trust them to be me in any room I couldn't be in. And I think that that's really special about this particular medium, those people are out there. But then you have to honor what they're bringing and also know what you don't know in face of what their expertise is or their challenges. Yeah, I'm actually, I think that it's, I, I don't want my employees to be happy. I want them to be whole and present. Um, and not, being happy is, it's kind of overrated, I think, in, in a way, in that like, most people don't wake up happy. You wake up at your baseline, and your baseline is, you know, I'm doing all right, you know, like I'm doing the best I can, you know, I'm getting through the day, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then when you're happy, well, you've achieved something, or someone said like, those are sick kicks, and I say, thank you very much, you know, or whatever it is. That makes me happy, but like, I don't try to live my life at every moment at like peak experience, right? Because then there would be no peak. But the, the real thing for employees uh, with, with us at Phenomena is that like, if you're having a shit week, and you let me know, like, I'm not going to be at my best this week because I broke up with my partner and I'm just in the, I'm in the bummers, you know. Or my puppy is sick and I'm worried, so I'm going to be home a couple days this week. Or you know, hey, it's it's been a really great working on this project, but I'm a little bit fried and I need a few days off. Like that's what I want to hear. So really, the goal is to to be developmental and that we're we're acknowledging that not every day is a happy day, but over time, if your baseline is generally positive, you bring that trust to the organization and the organization builds that trust with every employee. So I think it's, happiness is a, is a complicated term. You know, uh, chaos is good news is what, yes. is what Pema would say. I like that. So you kind of all touched on the how, right? So we kind of all in agreement on that we should have a positive culture, if that means happy employees all the time, probably not, but, uh, but at least a whole uh, person can show up, right? So. How do you actually create this positive culture where the whole person can show up and, and give their best to the organization? I, mean, I just am honest when I have a shitty day. I mean, that's really it. It's like I just, I live those values every day with the people that I work with. And when I'm not doing good, people know. And when things are great, they know. And if I feel uncertainty, we talk about it. And I just try to lead from that place of honesty, honestly. So Robin, hold on, before you give up the mic on that, that sounds really vulnerable. It like is. Like you're really vulnerable to your staff. Isn't that kind of scary? And shouldn't CEOs be, you know, always thought of as uh, <laughs> leading and strong and strength and I know what's going on. I'm not going to drop the ball. So, so <laughs> how, how do you reconcile those there's two? A, there's a video game that I really love uh, made by Matsuri Masaya. Um, it's, a, it's called Parappa the Rapper. And Parappa the Rapper is a, is a little dog who's in love with a flower named Sunny Funny. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's an enemy in the picture and uh, that is Joe Chin. And Joe Chin Joe. is a giant strapping dog with a big chin and a blonde poof, you know? And I think that, yeah, the idea that we all have to be Joe Chin in order to be in charge is total bullshit. You know, like, I think it's very important to be sunny funny sometimes and some days to be Parappa. You know, like, you got to bring what, what Parappa says is you got to believe. And I think that as a CEO, if I walked around like, you know, you know, it's, you know, it will always be closing and that kind of crap, you know, like then who's going to want to work with me? I wouldn't want to work with that person. I don't want to be that person. I mean, I live in San Francisco for a reason. I love being here. You know, I'm part of the rainbow nation. I think we should all, we should all love one another and respect one another and be part of a big family, but not without boundaries as we discuss. And I think that, you know, my vulnerability and being able to be open and admit that I make mistakes every day is what makes it possible for my employees to come to me when they've screwed up and we have an honest conversation. And then it's like, all right, well, just don't do that again. I mean, you're really good at this. 
I was going to just um, add to what you're saying as far as like, I own when I make a mistake and then I get into solution based. Like, okay, I take responsibility for what I've done, but then I'm also looking to be proactive to not do the same thing over and over again. And as long as I'm humble and can laugh at myself and not take myself too seriously, because we aren't doing brain surgery. Mm -hmm. We are trying to create something that's uh, fun, engaging, and, and meaningful and have people think about it. But I also know that as humans, when we get stuck, we are in charge of our own toggle switch and we can back up from that maze. So um, allowing the space to know that I can create the opportunity to be unstuck myself is cool. I think um, a, a concept that's emulated in, in what both of you just said is the concept of servant leadership, which is a value that we have at IME, which is no matter you know what your role is, that everyone in the company is leading and they're leading all the time, and that the goal of being a leader is developing other leaders within the company. And part of that is showing the vulnerability and showing them that that's okay. Um, and then in terms of, you know, I think the only other thing I would say about, you know, fostering an environment or, or a, a culture that makes that okay, um, establishing two things as a leader, the, the why of your organization. So not the what or the how. It's really hard. I think people get bogged down if they're only focusing on the what or the how or creating a product or, you know, doing an IP agreement or whatever it is, but that there's a sense of purpose that's broader than wealth. Um, that people can plug into um, and have a purpose when they're at work. So, Jesse, do you um, write that down? How do you articulate your why then to your community? Mm -hmm. um, the why? <laughs> It's ingrained in everything that we do. So ours is, I mean, I said in the beginning, it's bringing bold ideas to life. It's something that it, it, uh, it, it um, shapes how we operate as a company, our business model, how we treat each other, what our values are, and then it's also reflected outward in um, how we interact with our clients, our partners, you know, our vendors. Um, so I would say it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy that's ingrained in everything and very well understood. The second part of that is that it leads to the organizational values, right? And something that's, that's not just written, but, but your job as a leader is breathing life into those values every single day. And I think that's very motivating for employees and helps keep them engaged. So it's like the behaviors that you're talking about as well and the values. So you're actually living your values every day. And so the, the, the community can actually see that, yeah. um, that it's not just something that you write, but you're living it, breathing it, um, demonstrating it for, uh, to, for it to be normalized throughout the community. Exactly. Sets the norms and expectations, right? Which saves a lot down the road, right? I mean, if you're, if you're just doing those two things, I think as a leader, you're miles down the road in avoiding conflict and a whole bunch of issues that are going to drain resources and time. We take a really similar tactic, but against each project, so that there's going to be core design principles really related to what are we trying to give the user in that experience that are persistent across each project. And so for us, that sense of team is that people can collaborate legitimately against that given what they understand and we're not ever trying to hang on to just one answer against the project. And so I think, especially because frequently we're, de we're developing on really emergent tech and it can be super scary, especially for the engineers, if they know that I don't care about it breaking or fixing it that way, but as long as we can hold up together those initial principles, then we can go on that journey and it's not so scary. So what happens, or do you I was just going to say that we have the same we have the same thing. So if you're working on in-flight hardware and you have, you know, like there'll be weeks where you have to reboot the machine every single time you want to, to make a change because it crashes somewhere in a loop and there's just literally nothing you can do and you're just like, Ugh, uh, like it's just constantly breaking in your face. You know, it's like your brain is getting reset all the time. And on those kinds of trips, you know, when you're embedded in, in with a partner, for example, or like when when everyone has come to the office and they're in the sweaty room, like trying to get the first version of it running, you know, those can go for hours and hours and hours. And in those moments, that's when tensions run high. And that's when people are really like, you know, we need to take a, like you were saying, a silly break, or we need to do something here. Like it's when you step out and come back with a lot of fresh juice, you know, or popsicles, you know, or you just say like, you know what, let's just go get shit faced tonight and tomorrow maybe it'll work, right? But this idea that like you can build the culture in those moments, I think is really, it's, it's so essential to working on emerging hardware and I think working in creative spaces right now, if that makes sense. 
I appreciate what you were saying because you need to know that they're, they may be freaking out. You have yeah. the empathy that they're freaking out, but you also know what you need is a bigger picture. And I think that's the yin and the yang of this that makes it work. And I would say in those moments, pause, mm -hmm. which is so small, but so powerful, is huge. And pause can have you step back and then do the re-entry. And I do use, I try to use humor. But yeah. <laughs> well, and, and will you actually talk about that? Because yesterday we met and we're just uh, brainstorming for this panel today. And Cheryl brought up a lot of like little phrases that you use with your team, sort of for the how moments of how you break um, the tension, if you will, uh, and, and to alleviate some of that tension so that people can start sort of, yeah, resetting their minds. So do you mind sharing a little bit of that with us? Um, sure. <laughs> Uh, I think, no, I think you're talking about, I said, say what you mean, mean what you say, and don't say it mean, yeah. which I think is really valuable because I've, ultimately we all want to be heard. And great ideas can come from anyone on, you know, on the team, no matter what position you're in. As we're open, if you're saying what you mean and you mean what you say and you don't say it mean, because the mean gets loud, and then that's all people hear. Yeah. So that's one of them. And then I also said, like, you know, when you learned when you were crossing the street when you were little, stop, look, and listen. When you enter a room, if you stop, take that pause, read the room, and listen, you'll get so much more out of that small moment to see where people are at. Yeah. So I, I think we have a, a big group, though, and I, um, in my group, we were talking about, because we happen to be women leaders, um, but the emotional quotient is a huge, and I was thinking about this after our talk yesterday was it's the soft uh, you know it's the soft strength yeah. it's a strength soft skills, yeah it's soft strength and there's hard strength and I think it's learning how to balance both and be comfortable with who you are yeah I was gonna say that that's actually in game design you have a soft loss and a hard loss condition so in like you know if you're playing shoots and ladders and you lose well it's kind of random so you don't feel so bad right but if you're playing poker and you lose and you lose a lot of money that's a hard loss and it's a specific it's specifically bad if the person maybe fibbed and got away with it right and like we love to play both those kinds of games but they have contexts and like if your team is playing poker against another team that's not in your group that's great but you shouldn't have people playing poker against each other at the table. That's, that's, that's you kind of want to keep it to shoots and ladders in the team context if you can. So I just got totally a five minutes left. So, oh, so uh, this is like so fast. Okay. Uh, so um, people always uh, want to do and have a positive culture, but they um, have obstacles that show up uh, that prevent them to doing that. So can you guys kind of talk about some of the obstacles that you guys see and how you overcome those obstacles in your startup culture? Um, that could even be like the investor pressure on you to just deliver, or that could be, um, you know, different personalities within the company that are maybe, uh, you know, very headstrong uh, in their ideas. Um, I don't think at the start of something that there's any excuse for bad culture. I think if it's happening, it's bad leadership and it's wrong ethics at the outset. I just, otherwise I don't get why it would happen. <laughs> Do you all agree with Melissa, or do you think that like still like I, sometimes there's creeps up some negative culture, and 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 that you have to sort of um, alleviate through that? I think both, but this is a really important point, and and I identify this a lot. If there are things going wrong, the first place you look is at yourself as a leader, hmm. um, and and I think that you know part of that uh, in thinking about challenges is um, in order to do that. I mean, it's a high level of self awareness, right, which is uh, an ongoing process, but it's also finding the time to unplug and uh, be able to look outside in. I mean, we spend so much time uh, throughout the day, I think probably everyone in this room looking inside out in order to make the company work. Um, and part of being a leader is stepping outside of that, looking outside in and really understanding what that experience is and finding time for generative thought. You know, not, not the kind of logistics or the mechanics of what's happening, but, but what are the larger issues that I need to, to highlight and frame as a leader? Uh, to that point, I would say, I go, what can I do and how can I help? And so I, look, I take a step back and I say, all right, um, ideas come and then problems occur. And what kind of, and you can have people that don't agree. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this yesterday. Like, it's okay to disagree. 
but then how do we get into solution base as quickly as possible? Because as startups, we don't have as much time and we don't have as much money. Mm -hmm. So how can we be effective by saying, here's what I'm learning. How can I, you share what you're learning and let's try to add the value together? Yeah, I think that the uncertainty that comes from being uh, bootstrapped in particular, if you are, and being in a creative space that's emerging slowly over time, like we all are now, is that creatives in that space feel the pressure, they want to perform, they want, they want the experience to be the best experience possible on the platform, or they want it to sell as many units as possible, or they want to reach as many people as possible. But there's this silent pressure of like the time and the money. And so what I try to do is to be very transparent with everyone, like, okay, this is how much runway we have, this is the, the kinds of BD I'm doing on these kinds of projects, these are the deals we're looking at, everything is a no until it's a yes, but you know, this is where we're at. And at first, when I started doing that, it felt weird to just be like coming home and like you just open the kimono and you're like, here's all the things I didn't get signed when I was in Tokyo, sorry, <laughs> you know? But like over time, as you start to sign things and get things done, it feels better. So I think that the, the real the real challenge is that uncertainty and it's in any creative project, but it's especially bad when there's a short timeline or, or, or money pressure or when people are struggling to do their best in a group. Or if you're not being open with your team about that. I mean, we yeah. take exactly the same approach. And I think everyone has the right to live with as much uncertainty as they're able to. And it's not up to me to make that choice for someone. But if I, same approach, totally transparent. Yeah. And, and we're all in it together in that way. And I think it's way different than carrying that just on single shoulders. But it's also better for everyone else involved. Yeah, you don't want to carry it as a, as a leader. I think that we've all learned to distribute the load. And I think that's something that young founders should really listen to. I, I was going to say also um, the uncertainty and allowing the space to let something marinate. Like the beauty in marination is it makes a delicious meal. So <laughs> how, you know, how, and you have to plant a seed and then you have to give it time to let it grow. And this is a business that is continuing to grow at a very rapid pace. Um, and the, creati the creativity is amazing, um, and the community is amazing. So uh, the empowerment of that is really what I've seen more so, um, especially here. So cool. And I'm grateful to this Women's Fund thing. Yeah. <laughs> here, here. Yeah. So is that it? Are we getting, is that it? Yeah. yeah. Good try. <laughs> 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 okay. Hi. Uh, if you've had the misfortune of having to remove a toxic person from the situation, what steps have you taken to make sure that any damage they've caused to the culture doesn't like metastasize? That's a hard one. Um, and actually, uh, I've had to deal with that in multiple in environments, not just my own company. And so um, I think that the steps that you take as you have an honest conversation with everybody about why it went on as long as it did. Because a toxic person doesn't usually get removed immediately. Um, uh, and there's, there's ways to make it s faster or slower. But like if you go onto a team and there's just someone on it, like I joined a team once and there was a toxic element on the team and they'd been there for a year. It's like, why haven't you fired this guy? Um, so you have that conversation, and then the next thing you do is you follow up with everybody after they're gone and say, okay, is there anything you want to tell me that I don't know already? Is there anything I can do to make it more possible for this to not happen in the future? You know, like if this person was an interrupter or they were really cruel or they were like totally sexist or they were just like a grouch. Like what, what can we do to, to have more, like basically to improve our no, no bozo policy? Like how, how, how can I do that? And I, I think really owning it as a leader, like should have probably ended sooner, sorry it didn't, what can I do to improve? That, that does help people like leach out the poison um, and then it's just time I think. I would just say, and, and whoever you use as your counsel, uh, be sure that you're um, you know, talking to someone around the legal process of hiring and firing before you do it. Um, there's a lot of uh, steps and considerations there, so you don't put your company um, at risk um, and have a, have a resource drain around something that could have been very simple to just get you know, three steps of advice on the front end.
Uh, yes, I uh, I kind of grew up in uh, like a, a traditional uh, a culture, kind of stodgy. Not I wouldn't call it necessarily positive team. So I'm evolving and growing. Uh, do you have any recommendations in terms of resources or next steps? Therapy. <laughs> It's always good for anyone. <laughs> you can. Um, there's a couple of books you can read specifically. I think that a lot of my employees read. Uh, one is called An Everyone Culture, which is the the book about deliberately developmental organizations, written by people from Harvard Business uh, Review. Uh, and then the other is Thanks for the Feedback, which just acknowledges that 99% of change comes from you actually hearing feedback. It's not that you got the feedback; it's that you actually listened, and then you took it on board and you evaluated it. And the last one is Nonviolent Communication. Um, it's just very, very basic language hacks that you can perform on yourself so that you are not otherizing, you are not me, them, but you are we in most of your conversations. Um, the four yeah, yeah, the four agreements is good. Um, and the six thinking hats, those are all really good. They're all really good books. And if you really want to go all the way, you can read Getting to Yes, which is just a negotiation book that's excellent. The Ford Foundation also in the fall is going to be releasing a study on different kinds of collaborative um, organizations and forms of collaboration, which I think is going to be really rich, just knowing some of the people that they're talking to. So I would encourage tracking that work. And one final book um, uh, recommendation, it's called Firms of Endearment, how world-class companies, uh, uh, how world-class companies profit from passion and purpose. Um, phenomenal book. Uh, yeah. Which one? So um, you guys kind of talked uh, about um, this through the, the questions, but um, I'm very curious on how you articulate risks to the team without articulating doubts in the mission of the company, um, I mean, particularly at an early startup stage? You can't. I mean, if there's risks, there's doubts. That's like, I mean, I don't think that it's possible to say, honestly, we're going to invest $3 million in a VR title and self-publish it when there's no market to build brand and have people go, oh, that sounds like a really profitable strategy, because it's not. It's not a, it's not a short-term profit strategy. It's a long-term, like, five years builds the brand of phenomena, 10 years makes us profitable. If you don't really want to be on board for 10 years of uncertainty, like, go work at Facebook. Like, and, and people have done that, and I encourage it. Like, I have placed employees in large organizations, but I've also rescued a lot of people from large organizations who are bored with going to the same desk every day and working on projects that constantly get reorged and pushed down and never see the light of day. Like, you can't have one without the other. But I also think it's your job as a leader. You have to legitimately believe that there's a future in what you're driving towards and that you can help deliver it to your team. And if you don't really have that faith, and it can't be imaginary, it has to be based on your track record, your wisdom, you, that you're going after something that you stand a chance of achieving, like that part is on you. Um, and, and I think that you know, there is a balance there. Well, that's vision. I mean, I think that what we're all talking about is that we all have a vision for how we want to execute this. And as leaders, we empower the team to make sure that they're along lines with the vision and um, embrace that. And that there's a sense of purpose, right? Uh, every one of us is talking with a sense of purpose and social action to pay it forward in our community. I mean, we've talked about empowering the young to make sure that they make their own companies. It's not to stay with us. And know how to listen when they walk into a room. We have to empower them with that too. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>